Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the fifth lecture of the Dr. Semo Zunyani Foundation. I am going to be your host today, and my name is Maba Tumurudi, one of the trustees for the foundation. I'd like to start by welcoming all our guests, starting with Prof. Sunil Maharaj. So he is the Deputy Vice Chancellor for the University of Pretoria. Welcome, sir. Um, most of our guests, we will be going through their profiles as we go. So if you could please be patient with us and our sincere apologies because we are running a bit behind schedule, but we will try and keep up as much as possible. Secondly, I'd love to welcome our patron, Dr. Seb Mutsuenyane. If I could please just ask everybody to stand up in honor of the old man. He hasn't been well, but he did make an effort to make it to, to this day. Thank you. Thank you kindly. Um, Ndata Mkholo wouldn't have been here and well taken care of without Mkhonu, um, Mkhonu Jocelyn. So if we could also please just give her a hand to say we are grateful <laughs> for all. Repol and Sabele, welcome. Uh, chairman, you have steered the ship up until this point. So for that, we are truly grateful. Our keynote speaker, Mr. Robert, we, we are grateful for having accepted our invitation to, to address us today and see how we take in this ship forward uh, in the future. May Edna, as well, Rale Boha, for having been holding hands with us on this journey up until, up until this point. We have seen great change since you came on board. I'd like to also acknowledge other speakers who will be presenting today. I'm not able to mention all of you by name currently, but I'll do so later. Also, in our midst, we have Kosi Nchaupe Makapan III, Rahwa Mukhelara. We have Mandulo Zulu, daughter of the King Zueli, Zueli Tini, uh, former Ambassador Monaisa, Prof. Wiseman Nguru, Chairman of KPMG, Dr. Ruel Koza, former Chairman of PIC, David Lezualo, Director of the Tabombeki School, UNISA, Mampa Ganyane, Deputy Chair of Chairs, Gauteng Legislature, uh, Peggy Debrain, MMC, Social Development, uh, Prof. Lulama Galinge, Council Member of the Tswane South College, Reverend Sekejane and Reverend Pungula, uh, Praise Singer Malefatsane Muzwenyane, and other representatives of the Mutsuinyani Foundation, as well as the representatives from the University of Pretoria. I have forgotten to mention the representatives of the diplomatic co-ops. Honored guests, welcome today to the fifth annual lecture. I hope we can all hold hands as we steer the ship of changing Africa for the better. Thank you. To kickstart our program this morning, I'd like to call upon Reverend Moachi Sikhejani to lead us in prayer. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, as we worship and praise and honor you, we recognize that all that we have and all that we do comes from you. We may this morning to give you thanks for, the, for blessing us with this beautiful soul, Ntati Mutsunyani, in his fifth annual lecture. We invite the Holy Spirit to guide and lead us with all our families and friends, colleagues, gathered here, we are aware that even a cloud of witness, Yabo Ramutsu Inyani, is with us. Those who are called to higher office and those belonging to the church triumphant. As we celebrate this son of the soil and the servant of the people, we ask, O Heavenly Father, for your mediation. We ask that you become part of the proceedings. 
we ask you, Heavenly Father, as we reflect and celebrate the life and legacy of Ndati Mutsunyani, that you be part of it. We ask you to help us commit to trust and continue his legacy so that we may know and grow as a nation for the future of our planet. We ask, Heavenly Father, that you enlighten our minds during the deliberations to the ways that can best serve those who are entrusted, that we are entrusted to him, to educate and transform their lives and the betterment of society. Bless our conversations with goodwill, sincerity, and truth. Help us see and understand issues faced by our communities. Give us wisdom to find solutions and the courage to see them through. May we be a people united with one goal, to develop, to skill, to equip those less fortunate. Now we ask you, take over, take charge, and guide these proceedings. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Um, Prof. Maharaj, you are up next. Um, and I wanted to just point out that as a trustee, when we started engaging with the University of Pretoria, what made me realize that Professor Kupe was quite serious about development in Africa is that our first planning meeting, we had departments upon departments that were represented at that meeting. And what that said to me is that we are united in, in purpose. And the realization that development cannot happen in silos, we need each other to make it work. So in order to introduce Prof Maharaj, he's a professor in the Department of the Electrical, Electronic and Computer Engineering. He has combined experience of more than 33 years in the in industry as a microwave and RF design engineer, academia and consulting. He holds a BSc Engineering Electronic, MSc Engineering Electronic and MSc Operational Telecommunications and a PhD in Engineering. He is also a professional engineer registered with the Engineering Council of South Africa, a fellow of the South African Academy of Engineering, a fellow of the South African Institute of Electrical Engineers and senior member of the IEEE. IE I -E. In 2018, he was founding chair of the IEEE SA section, Vehicular Technology Society chapter. He has been involved in organizing many conferences, technical events such as the IEEE AFRICON, IEEE ICC 2010, and as general conference chair for IEEE VTS 2019 Wireless Africa conferences and the 2020 and 2022 World Engineering Education Federation and Engineering Dean's Council Conference. He has previously uh, been head of Department of Engineering and Electronic and Computer Engineering between 2014 and 2022, served as Dean of the Faculty of Engineering, Built Environment, Information Technology until his appointment as Vice Principal Research, Innovation and Postgraduate Education in August 2022. Welcome, sir. Thank you, thank you, Program Director. <clears throat> I hope I can use that. So, um, Dr. Sam Mutsunyane, founder um, of the Foundation and Rural Foundation Development. Uh, Honored to have you at University of Pretoria. Thank you again, and thank you for the leadership and the support you have done. You have <clears throat> contributed to this country over the years, and we're honored to have you again this morning at University of Pretoria. Of course, the other dignitaries from the Foundation Chairperson. Uh, Dr. Paul Chabele, um, of course, board members, one of my colleagues I met today, Professor George Leniai, who has uh, been a colleague of mine for many, many years, and glad to see him after, I think, 30 years today. 
uh, also involved in that. And of course, our founding member and guest of honor and speaker today, Ms. Gloria Sherobe. Welcome very much, ma'am. Wonderful to have you on our campus. And of course, the incoming trustees and of course, trustees that's gonna be there. Of course, our ambassadors from the different parts, our dignitaries today here, ladies and gentlemen, family of uh, Dr. Sam Matsuenene and other colleagues. Wonderful to have you this on our University of Pretoria campus, and thank you for being here. So good day and welcome to everybody here today. Of course, on behalf of our Vice Chancellor and Principal who is, could not be here today, so I'm acting on his behalf, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to you to the fifth annual Dr. Sam Motswenyana Lecture. It is a great privilege for the university to once again be playing a part in hosting this distinguished event here at our Future Africa Research Platform, which has become an important annual feature on our calendar. As an institution, we are passionate about power of partnerships and are grateful for the relationship we have with the Dr. Sam Motswenyana Foundation. The outstanding work done by the foundation is an inspiration for us as we strive towards our goal of strengthening the university's social responsiveness and impact in society. Addressing the needs and challenges impeding the development of township and rural communities in South Africa, particularly in the agricultural sector, and thereby stimulating economic activity in these areas, has been of critical relevance ever since the esteemed Dr. Sam Motsunyane began to dedicate this, his life to pioneering and promoting entrepreneurship and black business during the days of apartheid. As we stand here in 2022, the vision remains as relevant as ever, as we remain a very unequal nation, facing a myriad of challenges which manifest most noticeably in the unacceptably high rate of unemployment and the dignity robbing poverty that grips a large part of our society. The selfless work being done by the foundation continues to uphold the concept of Ubuntu, of Africanism, which of course embodied in Dr. Motsanyane, who has throughout his career modeled the very essence of self-driven leadership in action, leadership which is compassionate, accountable, and introspective. Thank you, sir, for your flawless example. As one of South Africa's best known and most successful entrepreneurs, with an interest in almost every major business sector in the country's economy, there is so much that our young job creators can learn from you. The ability to be big despite the challenges, the importance of investing in the development of necessary strategic and technical capabilities, and how to exercise wise choices, such as creating your own compelling vision and agenda, and being confident and courageous enough to follow your dreams, no matter how long it takes, are just some starting points, and most importantly, your humility. This morning, we look forward to hearing from another extremely well-respected business person, our keynote speaker, Ms. Gloria Serobe, who is a pioneer in the field of broad-based economic empowerment for women, who has, during her career, made a unique and outstanding contribution to transformative social engagement. We are so grateful for the opportunity to learn from and be inspired by a trailblazer who has worked tirelessly and strategically to achieve necessary change. Our country has overcome so many obstacles and often through the cumulative impact of courageous individuals whose actions have changed the course of history. As a leading research intensive university in Africa, we see our role at the University of Pretoria as developing people and creating knowledge which will overcome the obstacles which lie ahead. The university is renowned for research breakthroughs that hold significant benefits to society. And we will continue to strive to find solutions for the nation, continent, and world's pressing issues. For example, two, three days ago, we launched the National Biosecurity Hub with Minister Toko Diriza and Minister Blaine Zamande. That's one example of our partnership with government to look at sustainable food systems through national biosecurity, because as we know, food is very important for our sustain sustenance for Africa and the world beyond. And we can see the challenges with food production, given the current challenges we're sitting with between Russia and Ukraine.
Of course, there are considerable challenges to be overcome in order to unlock the potential of Africa and achieve the African Union 2063 agenda of, I quote, a prosperous Africa based on inclusive growth and sustainable development where poverty is eradicated in one generation, close quote. But given that the future of the world depends on the future of Africa due to the sheer size of its rapidly growing youthful population, we are left with no other option than to rise to the challenge and to empower our youth and develop them as future leaders. We do this new knowing that our forefathers did, that this transformative work cannot be done alone, and that it is certainly not for ourselves, but for the very livelihood of our future generation. I think we owe it to our future generation. Furthermore, the University of Pretoria has made great strides through its high-tech incubator and accelerator to support its student entrepreneurship and on job creation opportunities. So Tax Innovation is a non-profit company which is owned by the University of Pretoria, and its main purpose is to support its students in high-tech business startups. In the 2021-2022 financial year, it supported 14 startups and whose turnover was around 18 million rand. We hope that through this initiative, we also make a small contribution to mitigating poverty, unemployment, and inequality that plagues our country. And we help our students not only to find jobs, but to help to create jobs, because they will help to employ the youth of the future. So welcome to all of you, and I look forward to the presentation by a distinguished speaker, Ms. Gloria Serova. Thank you for this opportunity for coming to University of Pretoria. Thank you for using our venue and our facility. And like we said, we always like to work with partners because as we have in Africa, we say, if you want to go fast, you go alone. But if you want to go far, we go together. Thank you very much and have a great event. Thank you, Prof. Um, so fitting, especially talking about food challenges. I was recently in Kenya, and it was unfortunate to see just how many young people are available there, yet the food insecurity is, is massive. And having spoken about food challenges, I'll move over to a chairperson whom I know is quite passionate about food security, uh, Mr. Paul Nsabele. So, Mr. Paul is the chairperson of the Dr. Sam Muzunyan Rural Development Foundation. He's an agronomist, an agribusiness, and land reform leader. He has passion for food security. He has led various leadership roles. He has held various leadership roles at the University of Pretoria and was part of the CIFA Students in Free Enterprise. He, he does pro bono work with smallholder farmers throughout the country and volunteers in various agricultural platforms. Welcome, Paul. Patron, it's such a privilege. Um, we are so blessed to, to have our patron at 95 years of age to be with us, Limama, thank you so much. Um, to the principal, uh, Maharaj, thank you for, for hosting us. Uh, to Medluria Serube, Medluria Serube used to be my boss. She used to be our chairperson um, at the Agricultural Development Agency. It's a pleasure and we look forward to, to, to the keynote address to Me Edna Monte. Uh, from the African Bank, we we very excited. Uh, thank you for for being with us. We have a partnership with the African Bank. To the CEO of the foundation, uh, Rema Tiba, thank you for all the hard work in arranging this lecture. To the deputy chair, uh, Prof. I thank you. To my trustees and the incoming trustees. To all the guests of honours and the diplomatic court. All protocol observed. To the guests and all those that are streaming live, thank you for joining us. Last week, I was crisscrossing um, KZN with the Ingonyama Trust. And uh, we, we started up north, and uh, we, we spent a few days. We, we, we stopped at different uh, valleys, seeing the different Inkosis. And um, one of the the valleys that we stopped at um, was in the Keza area, in Klabatini, one of the, the beautiful lands where 
the, the land is quite green and lush and uh, you've got spring water, you've got rivers uh, meandering through, through the land and um, you, you even have waterfalls, beautiful waterfalls that we, we, we drove through. And uh, we, we, we sat with uh, Inkosi Mdebele and uh, he, he was telling us that, you know, he, 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 he's quite concerned about uh, the lack of development on one of the fertile land with so much water. And um, in, in the last days, uh, last week, we, we then went to, to the south coast um, around the, the Harding town in the south coast uh, in the uh, Mzimkulwana valley, beautiful valley where we, we drove through the forest, we drove through the Kwamcha forests. We, we, we then spent some time with uh, Inkosi Jali in the Jali Valley. And uh, we, we sat with him and he, he was telling me a story that during the July unrest, he, the, his community was at risk of, of not being able to even buy food because the hiding town was closed. And as he's talking to me, I'm actually looking through a stream of water and be, behind the hut, there's a forest that shows you how lush the land is. And um, on, on my way back, uh, I was actually coming to, to the board meeting and the, the, the flight was delayed. And I, I sat with my colleagues from uh, University of South Africa Enterprise and we, we were baffled and, and we were lost for words at the vastness of the land that we saw when we did the tour within Gonyama Trust. And, and the water that was available. And, and in, in, in arriving at the airport, I rushed to our board meeting. And I, I, I thought of a quote which was mentioned by Professor Wazman Nkutlu, who, who delivered the lecture in 2020 in this room. And he, he quoted from uh, our patron's book that it must be a sin before the eyes of the Lord to have land and still suffer from hunger. And um, as, as a foundation, we, 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 we exist and we believe that the biggest challenges that we, we face as a country is poverty, its hunger, and its inequality. And we, we exist on a day-to-day -to, -day to, to come up with solution and solutions and, and solve some of those challenges. One of the, 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 the partnerships that we have that we're very proud of is the partnership with the University of Pretoria. In uh, 2020, the Vice Chancellor, Professor Tawano Kupe, announced the, the partnership that we, we were going to get to with the university. And I'm happy to report that we, we then engaged with the university. Um, we, we had a, a workshop. Uh, Memuru mentioned the workshop where we, we had all, all the different deans from the different faculties. We had the Faculty of uh, uh, Agricultural and, and Natural Sciences. We had the Dean from Economic and Management Sciences, the Onestepurt uh, Campus, the Dean of Humanities, because we, we view the problems of this country as something that cannot be solved from one angle. The structural uh, problems that we, we need to solve to, to, to make sure that the, the, the country goes forward and the issue of hunger, which was earlier mentioned, is solved. And the partnership was then finally announced on the 27th of January this year. And we collaborated on five key uh, issues. One of them is the alleviation of poverty and, and hunger. And the second one is entrepreneurship. The, the third collaboration is on the productive use of land. And the fourth one is looking at climate smart and the green economy to ensure that when there's this transition of the green economy, we have the people in the rural areas that are not left out in this development. And lastly, we partnered on the issue of uh, revitalizing the, the economy, the township economy. So we're excited about what is going to come from that partnership. We've already identified an area we, we, we have all these experts that are working with us as a foundation to ensure that we come up with pilot projects, we leverage the technical and the, the skill set that exists within the university, Professor Maharaj, to come up with uh, practical solutions because it doesn't help anyone for, for, for the university to do all this research that then goes into journals and nobody uses it. We, we're also very much excited about the partnership with the African Bank 
we, 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 we announced a partnership and we have a MOU with the African Bank and we collaborated with the African Bank where one, they acknowledged the, the founder of the bank. One of the, the, the stories which we, we, we came up when we, we, we were busy with this was that even the people that are working for the bank did not know that a black man started the bank. And uh, it's a story that we are excited that the, the, one of the partnerships includes us doing a documentary. So there's a documentary that's coming up where it tracks the life of our patron and also how the bank was founded. And we think this story needs to be told because even now with the freedom and the power and the leverages that we have, we, we have black people that are not able to do what our patron was able to do with this generation during apartheid. In, 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 in responding to Dr. Tami Mazwai last year, uh, Dr. Rok was uh, presenting the lecture here at the University of Pretoria at the Olak building. He said that uh, one of the, the things that he observes is that he believes that those that are in power might not know how to use the leverage of power that they have to up, up, uplift the conditions of our people. Our patron always reminds us that the National Party legislated itself out of poverty and it reminds us of the white problem, the white poor problem, which was done by the Carnegie Foundation study. And, and we believe that through such partnerships, we'll be able to stimulate people that can be able to come up with the solutions. We also have uh, in the MOU, the renaming of the buildings, where the, the, the buildings, the main campus of African Bank has been named after our patron. We've got a partnership to do the development and I'll let Mayor Edna speak more about it with uh, the Dr. Selmo Tsunyani Communities uh, Comprehensive School. And we also have a Dr. Selmo Tsunyani uh, scholarship. We already have a cohort this year that is uh, the inaugural cohort from locally up all the way to, to from UCT that we've dispersed funds and we're working with to create a generation of the caliber of the leader that our patron is. And we also have an entrepreneurial grant that um, we, we hope to create entrepreneurs that can emulate our, our patron. So we, we, we're quite excited and we, 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 we're looking forward as, as the foundation to play a meaningful role in the development of our people. Thank you so much. Um, as you speaking, I got reminded of a, an experience that Ntatemokolo had um, that he, he spoke about in his book, The Testament of Hope, uh, where he mentions that during the time that they were setting up a bank, an old man, he met up with an old man that came to make his contribution. And a, con a comment that this old man made was that um, it's like planting a tree. Um, I'm contributing this money. I may not be able to see the benefits myself, but my children will be able to see these benefits. And I do believe that every efforts that we're making now, it's planting those trees that we're hoping that future generations will be able to enjoy the shade in, in future. Um, we're moving over to Me Edna Munse. We've worked so well with her over the last year. We've done great, made great strides. Um, mainly because of her passion. Mayor Edna has been pushing and pushing and pushing to see things happen. And she, I, I can safely say she's man managed to do exactly that. So she's the group executive at African Bank um, under transformation and sustainability. Uh, Edna Munse manages and leads an extensive portfolio that comprises of transformation, sustainability, ethics and BEE stakeholder management, enterprise and supplier development, and ESG. As chief of staff, it is also Edna's role to ensure that the many initiatives of the bank's audacious Accelerate 25 strategy resonates amongst its people. Her role also includes leading the African Bank Strategy Execution Office, and Enterprise Project Management Office in support and enablement of its audacious Accelerate 25 strategy. Welcome. Galevora. Uh, 
I am so grateful to be here with you today. I think that um, when I got to meet uh, Major Selin and meet Le, Le Papa Motsonyani last year, I really, you know, was not fully aware of how much my life would change and how much I would grow. Um, I represent, as I stand here, all African bankers in saying that we, we really are grateful for our heritage, for the legacy that you have built, for the legacy that, that you have handed over to us, for us to be able to carry forward. And as African bankers, we say that we really know, without a doubt, that we would not be here if it was not for your leadership and the caliber of the ideologies that you carried and that you sought to see come to reality. When we, we speak as African bankers in the very many engagements that we have around who we are and who we are meant to be, one of the things that really rings through, that really stands to be our vision, our purpose, and our mission combined is about the fact that we see ourselves and we know that our birth is one that says we are a bank for the people, by the people, serving the people. That is something that we are that is who we are, and that is who we have lost our way along the way and forgot who we are, but that is who we are becoming. And so as I stand here before you today, I just want to maybe share with you some of the initiatives that we've put in place towards us being able to, to go towards that purpose, that vision, that mission of having the audacity to believe that we can reclaim our heritage and really live the legacy of who we are meant to be. As Ndata uh, Ntavele has said, we have uh, put in place a partnership with the Dr. Sam Mozunyani Foundation. And this was an important partnership for us because it sought to say that as we embark on this journey of our strategy, which we affectionately call Accelerate 25, and the reason why we call it Accelerate 25 is that we want excellence that is going to be accelerated for us to achieve certain goals by the year 2025. And so our Accelerate 25 strategy really guides us to say, how do we start to become who we are meant to be and go back to our heritage? And so the foundation really serves as a partner that reminds us, because as you would know in life, you do sometimes find yourself losing your way. You do sometimes find yourself faced with challenges that shape you in a different direction than that which you were necessarily born for. And so the African bank of today is, I am proud to say, becoming the African bank that you sought to make it. We had found ourselves in a situation where we were a monoline business, so we only lend and lend credit line only to specific individuals. However, I stand here today proud to say that is no longer the case. We now have got a transactional business which sees us putting in place savings and investments products that is really led by, by a really great uh, um, a businessman and really great executive, Spongsen Ngunze, who's really sought to see us start to go back to saying, how do we bank the people of South Africa? The unbanked, the underserved. We also have put in place a, a business banking portfolio. We have recently purchased a Green Dot Bank, which is a business bank, because we understood that although we want to build a business bank that can answer to some of what you were trying to achieve when you conceptualize this together with your colleagues at NAFCOC, Bunda de Gadi, Bunda de Mabonya, and really conceptualized the African bank, we understand that today some entrepreneurs have got different challenges to those of that day. But they also have different opportunities brought upon by digitization and technology. And so with the acquisition of Green Road Bank, we hope that as the African bank, and we intend in fact as the African bank, to be able to become the place where all entrepreneurs find a, a home that says, the organization that I bank with that provides me with financial services uh, um, and, and re related products is able to actually back me as an entrepreneur and assist me to be able to flourish 
<clears throat> but also be able to assist me in those areas that perhaps I am not so strong as, such as other administrative duties of tax, being, being tax compliant, being uh, legally compliant, your, your HR um, um, elements of business, so that you focus on the business that you want to do and ensure that you drive your passion. That is the business bank that we are building. I'm happy to also then on behalf of African bankers say to you that we really have ensured that we, we forge a much closer relationship even with NAFCOC. In um, this week, in fact, let me not say last week because time flies so fast, but this week I was with the uh, colleagues of NAFCOC, the chairperson of NAFCOC and KZN, speaking about some of the initiatives that we want to do in KZN. And so the approach that we're using is one that says we don't only share our plans, we actually come back and report and say this is how far we've gotten, we want to go further, let's go further together. And so we were able to share with them the fact that we've got three schools in the KZN region, one in Underberg, one in Mbangeni, and one in Kwamsaba <laughs> Walingana. I had to wait and say it in my mind so that my Sepedi translates into Zulu. Um, and, and so these three schools are schools that we have chosen that are really very far from your metropolitan areas, but that we believe in contributing to education and to building future leaders, contributors and value adders to our economy, we should be able to start there. And so we are building infrastructure, building classrooms and so forth, and we are ensuring that the very people who are actually building come from those communities. So in line with our MOU, with the service providers that are helping us with the construction and infrastructure development, I am proud to say that every single employee who is hired, whether to lay bricks, <coughs> pardon me, to put down tiles, to be able to do the plumbing, the electrification and so forth, every single one of them comes from those local uh, communities. And so that is one of the ways that we're really living out what you have taught us. I am here today to really also share the fact that we understand that as a bank for the people, by the people, serving the people, this is not a journey that we can walk on our own. This is a journey that requires as many of the people who share that mission and vision to be able to walk with us. Because who we are is a bank that banked the people of South Africa when no one else would. Who we are is a bank that really believes and has got the audacity to believe in a greater South Africa where more of us are part of the mainstream economy. Who we are is a bank for the people, by the people, serving the people, and we are proud to be the African Bank. Thank you. Memonsa, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's, it's quite inspiring because for us, it says, Bonta Temoholo have walked this journey. You've taken over now. And all it says that is that anybody can do it. We are truly grateful. We are, we are hoping that it's inspiring for each and every one of us here to say somebody has walked this journey to this point and somebody has taken from that point to the next who's taking from the next. And we're hoping through these lectures, young people listening everywhere will be take from that and run and run with it for, for the future. Now we're moving on to Mesa Robe, um, the lady of the moment. We've never had a woman uh, in our lectures. And that was one of the main things that we insisted on for 2022. Jorge, let us hear from Mesrove, how they've done it. From 1994, how Whiphold has made strides as well, similar to Bonta Temoholo in very challenging conditions, how you've managed to I think, I think a big challenge that we have is implementation. So we, we tend to speak about policies that are quite good um, in South Africa, but we have a serious challenge with the implementation. So it's always good to hear from people that are actually doing the actual work and so that some of us can be inspired and we can also start. So Meso Robert was born in Gugule to Cape Town on the 20th of September, 1959. She obtained a BCom degree and also an MBA degree at the University of New Jersey, USA. 
She's a founding member and executive officer of WIPHOLD, the first women group established post-1994 to list on the JSE. Her professional experience includes positions at Ex Exxon Corporation in the USA, Munich Reinsurance Company of South Africa, the Premium Group and Standard Corporate and Merchant Bank. She was the Executive Director, Finance, Transnet Limited, and was a member of the Transnet Board and its major subsidiaries. Gloria is a chairperson of the Solidarity Response Fund incorporated in March 2020. You are allowed to forget your phone, Tata Moholo, at your age. <laughs> In response to the president, to President Cyril Ramaphosa's call for national unity at the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic in South Africa, she serves on several boards, including Hans Marensky Holdings, Adcorp Holdings, and Dinell. She's an honorary member of the Actual Society of South Africa and is a member of the SICA Advisory Council. Welcome, Me. Thank you. Thank you sir. Thank you very much, uh, uh, honorable guests. The, the program director has helped us with making sure uh, everybody has been acknowledged. And uh, so I don't have to repeat that. I just can only say I'm excited to be here. Very excited to be here. Um, Dadim Zonyan, it is such an honor just to sit next to you, even if I say nothing. <laughs> it's just so special, man. It is just so special. There's so much to learn uh, uh, from, from you. I was telling Dr. Mutsonyane that from here I'm off to the airport. I'm going to Saudi Arabia, which is where the first ambassador uh, for the democratic South Africa to Saudi Arabia, it was Dr. Mutsonyane. And he covered five countries while he was there in the region, uh, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, uh, UAE, Yemen, and Oman. And if you have a picture of that map, it's a lot of work. And uh, of course, he was very young. So he could do that. So I'm looking forward to meeting the Saudis. And I will tell the Chamber of Commerce about your foundation. Uh, the OU, the OU support. I will make sure. Um, this was supposed to be the easiest a lecture to make because it is a lecture of somebody that I love a lot. It just made it difficult because uh, his work covers a long period. And so in the audience, I started getting confused that the leader of today, whether in business or in, uh, in any part of the civil society or in government, the leader of today is 30 something years old. Uh, the whole story of apartheid is fading. And so when you try to put a context to what exactly he did, you have to spend a bit of time on it because uh, somebody who is 30 something uh, today is born after 1980. And uh, we have to keep rehashing the story in a positive way, because Dr. Mzonyane wants us to use that story in a positive way. Um, and then in the audience, you also have uh, people who also brought us up now. I see uh, Ntate Koza is here. 
Uh, he's my big brother, and he's always watching. Please don't put a foot wrong. Uh, I'm watching you. It's such a beautiful space to be in because the reason we are not in trouble is because there are people that we are scared of. It's very important. And then uh, last week, uh, Professor Nkutu threatened me now that even if he's on virtual, he's in the front seat. He was my professor for first year. And this is somebody who has seen me growing up, and he threatened me, you dare not embarrass me in that uh, lecture. So Dr. Mzungana, it, it just became quite a complicated uh, lecture to make having all those people in mind, but try I will. Um, I am in awe of this great man, Dr. Mutsuanyan. I still have to understand how I was given the huge honor of being asked to deliver this lecture to this 95-year-old great icon of ours, while he can still hear what I think of him even more intimidating and frightening, uh, may you were not in the house, but it was to sit with him for almost five hours in his house in Winterfeld, listening as he talked me through his life, only a tiny bit of which I knew about. But Dadamo Sonyana coming from a business family in Cape Town, uh, in the 1970s. As children, we all knew when Dr. Metsonyana was coming as a president of NAFCOC. You will remember these names, Otatu Vogwana, uh, Otatu Mama, uh, Otatu Mamfany, uh, Okati, Otatu Fondo, uh, Otatu Pelwan, Otatu Phillips. Remember the names. Mr. Gonzo, Mr. Luke, and others. They were then the leading lights of, uh, of black business in the Western Cape. As the children, we looked forward to this because there was always a chance when you're making tea, there will be some muddy biscuits left over and lemon creams, uh, and so you were always the first one to go and fetch that tray because you know there's something left there. It is therefore a fair reflection to say that whip hold, nail, rail, nozala, uh, worldwide, WDB, all those early entities, we are the products of this living legend and visionary. As his children, he made us believe that we can actually do it. As a visionary, the character of uh, Dr. Mutsonyane is pretty much the same in my mind as that of that old scholar, Reverend Diosoga portraying the art of bequeathing a massive legacy to South Africa in a way that is irreversible. Because of these age groups, I had sought to spend just two minutes on Reverend Diosoka to explain why I actually see this similarity. And so in 1829, Reverend Tiosoka was born to a traditional family in the rural Eastern Cape and became one of the first blacks to go to school. Following the Scottish missionaries who were his mentors, he ended up being a famous scholar at the University of Glasgow in Scotland in literature and in theology. He is, amongst his many achievements, very much associated with this famous song, Liza Lissitingalaku, as a composer. But the biggest legacy 
that uh, Diosoga left behind for South Africa is very much through his two children, William Anderson Soga and Jotelo Festiri Soga. According to the late Professor Bongan Mayosi, who was a cardiologist and dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences at, U at UCT, Dior Soga's firstborn son, William Anderson Soga, became the first black doctor in South Africa, having qualified in Glasgow in 1883. That was 30 years before UCT established its own medical school, or 60 years before vets and UCT accepted blacks into their medical faculties in 1941. This inspired several doctors who came after him, like uh, Dr. Moroga, Dr. Kuma, Dr. Montenegro, and Dr. Yusuf Dado. Between 1918 and 1934, all these people qualified overseas and mainly at the University of Edinburgh, given that VETS and UCT only accepted black medical students after 1941. But they all went on to become famous. Dr. Moroka and Dr. Kuma became successive presidents of the African National Congress, while Dr. Naika revived the Natal Indian Congress, and Dr. Yusuf Dadu became the leader of the Transvaal Indian Congress and leader of the South African Communist Party. They left an enormous legacy in South Africa's field of medical science and health, which has become one of the most highly regarded internationally. And so when in 2020 COVID showed up all over the world, it became very clear that each country was going to have to depend and be led by its own scientists for solutions. And so as the chairman of the Solidarity Fund, I'm very proud to say that for scientific and intellectual direction in this battle zone, I relied completely on the COVID response team under the leadership of our own, very own, Professor Salim Karim, a product of this former medical school at the University of Natal, then called Wentworth. South Africa has been applauded by the World Health Organization and the rest of the world for the manner in which we handled this pandemic. Such is the strong legacy that Tio Soga and William Anderson Soga, his son, left behind with medicine and health. It is actually his second son, uh, Dr. Jodelo Soga, who became the first ever South African of any race to receive a degree in veterinary science. In 1886, he qualified at the Edinburgh College of Medicine and Veterinary Medicine as a member of the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons with a gold medal distinction in botany. After coming back home to South Africa, he helped eradicate rinderpest, a highly contagious and fatal cattle disease that almost decimated South Africa's cattle stock. For the next 26 years, until 1925, he was the only veterinary surgeon, both black and white, of any color in South Africa. And so befittingly, uh, in May 2009, the University of Pretoria named the library after him at the Faculty of Eternal Science. It is now called 
Dr. Joe Delo Festi Library. We need to really give a round of applause to University of Pretoria to recognize uh, these icons of ours. And so besides his own influence in theology and literature, what I'm trying to say here is that Reverend Tiyosoga left behind a huge legacy in these two areas, in medicine and health and in agriculture in a way that is irreversible. And then I come to the legacy of Dr. Munzonyane. You're going to see the same kind of trend. 100 years after Dio Soga was born, in 1829, a baby born was born in Pochestrom in 1927 to the late uh, Solomon P. and Christina Muzonyane. He was to be named Samuel Mukheti Muzonyane. And given the harsh realities of the South African political environment for blacks, his parents could not have imagined he would grow to be such a towering figure, straddling business and politics. Unlike Triosoga, who died at the age of 42 years, at 95 years old, Dr. Manzonyana has the privilege of still being here, directing the orchestra of what business should look like and holding firmly in his hands his dreams for agriculture and rural development. <laughs> and we have to thank God for that. To understand what this Dr. Mzunyane legacy means, you have to pay some attention to the apartheid program. And this is where my confusion was, how do I speak to a 32 something? How do I speak to a 42 something? What is inflated in our own minds about this legacy has got to be put into this context. This apartheid program and its intended destructive impact on blacks over so many years. The apartheid system was the most complex, very sophisticated program of excluding blacks from any possibility of economic emancipation. The apartheid government fielded their best brains to implement this program of black exclusion. They had the sharpest instruments to monitor its ex execution. Nothing was left to chance. And the apartheid knots were tied with such precision and military attention over many, many, many years. Financial exclusion and depriving blacks of access to financial services was one of the most effective instruments used to make sure blacks would be permanently excluded from the mainstream of the economy. Also controlling the movement of blacks between rural and urban areas and heavily monitoring these movements was another effective instrument. It was particularly important that these rural areas were deliberately undeveloped, partly to serve as cheap labor sending areas to big businesses like uh, mining. It is the reversal of these two instruments that seems to have occupied Dr. Mujutsonyana's mind in everything he did. Attempting to undo all of this horrible past, it required a lot of attention to detail, with the same amount of precision to untie these apartheid knots. This explains 
why it is in these two areas that Dr. Monsonyana's legacy is most pronounced. The financial inclusion of blacks through African bank and agriculture and rural development. Boldness, courage, and intentionality with, as African Bank says, with so much audacity, is what was required to untie these knots. And these character traits, Dr. Mensonyane has got them in abundance. Even as he sits on that wheelchair, you can actually see them. If I can spend a bit of time on the African bank and the financial inclusion of blacks, these three sectors that direct the economy of any country anywhere in the world are banking, are life insurance, and the retirement industry. And one of the many reasons for this is that they carry the savings of depositors, they carry the premiums of policyholders, and they carry the contributions of the beneficiaries of the retirement funds. This for anywhere in the world becomes that main source of investment capital. And so all over the world, access to finance capital and financial services is important for everyone for wealth creation and for wealth preservation. And so depriving blacks of this access was extremely critical for the apartheid government project to succeed in keeping blacks away from the economic mainstream. It now sounds very strange to say that even as late as 1989, blacks were not allowed to be members of the pension funds, and this was legislated. It's very difficult to take, to tell a 32-year-old child this, that we were not allowed to be members of the retirement uh, industry. It is in this context that the audacity of uh, Dr. Mswenyane as NAVCOG leadership in forcing the establishment of African Bank is beyond anyone's uh, imagination. Bold, courageous, and intentional. And most importantly, no hurdle was going to be too big or too high to stop him. It took 10 years from 1964 to 1974 to raise this 1 million rents licensing fee that was required to start a bank. And so African Bank was established in 1975. The beauty and the privilege you have, Dr. Mansonyan, is that you are now witnessing your own children battling it out there in their most professional and intellectual way to make sure that African Bank is that bank that you had in mind in 1964. The likes of Lisa Khanyaho at Central Bank, Governor, and his team the likes of Kenneth Dipungane, the CEO and his team, or Tabo Loti, the chairman and their teams are all playing in this orchestra conducted by you to make sure that never again will blacks be so crudely excluded from the economic mainstream. Even the young Ricky Ricky gave off his last hours on earth. Just do it for you, Dr. Mzwenya. And so we watch with a lot of excitement as this African bank project of yours is unfolding 
in the most aggressive intellectual way. And the teams consolidating to create the scale that is required to compete with the established banks. Most importantly, even though we still have a long way to go, this legacy of yours in banking and financial inclusion for blacks through African Bank seems completely irreversible. Nobody can touch you now. If we move to rural development and agriculture, which is the second area of your focus, is on the difficult matter of this rural development with emphasis on agriculture. Rural agricultural development is made more complicated by the fact that over 32% of the South African population lives in rural, rural areas. From a distance, it just seems that for rural agricultural development, all you need is to bring mechanization and the rest will follow. But many, many years of deliberate underdevelopment of rural areas means that to, to succeed with rural agricultural development in South Africa, you need just about every bit of intellectual capacity and grit and hard work. Dr. Monsonyana is a qualified social worker by profession having qualified at Jan Hofmeyer School of Social Work. He was then sent to Ngocha in Gofenbaba in the Eastern Cape to train social workers that would work with rural communities. This experience led him to be appointed as a national organizing secretary of the African National Soil Conversation Association in 1953. Its purpose was to promote soil conservation throughout the country. And so thus began his interest in the use of land and rural development. He later got a scholarship to study for a BS in agriculture at the North Carolina College in the US. His passion quickly turned towards rural development and the use of existing land, not only as primary growers, but across the value chain. This became one of the key focus areas of the Dr. Mzonyane Foundation. It is therefore not surprising that the University of Pretoria so it fit to sign an MOU with the Dr. Monsonyana Foundation in January 2022 to collaborate in areas including rural development, poverty and unemployment alleviation and township economic revitalization. We must congratulate and show appreciation to the University of Pretoria Prof. For deliberately as, uh, assuming this role to make Dr. Mutsuanyane's dream of rural development a reality. I think let's give a round of applause. <laughs> he is grappling with the debate of land expropriation without compensation and trying to reconcile this with the vast tracts of fallow land in the hands of government and tribal leadership in rural areas. He maintains a cautious approach to this subject and would love to see the agricultural sector as a basis for industrialization of rural areas. His project in grain, citrus, and vegetables 
cover the provinces of Gauteng, Limpopo, and Northwest. And as with most development projects, Dr. Mtswengane has had his own disappointments. The Dr. Mtswengane Foundation experienced a project that was vandalized and looted after being handed over to the communities for which it was founded. Cause that hurts. This, he says, was one of the lowest points in his life. Clearly, this community had no buy-in to this project. But to respond to this mayhem, the Dr. Mutsuanyana Foundation created what is now called an asset-based development approach as opposed to a need-based community approach. He believes this approach prepares communities for successful project implementation with the aim to reduce the high failure of development uh, initiatives, to shift the mindset of communities from being consumers to producers, to appreciate and identify community assets and unlock their potential, to partner effectively with external partners and to provide local solutions. We were therefore very much flattered as we polled when the Dr. Mzwenyana Foundation approached us to share about our own experience in the rural Eastern Cape with a maize and soya bean operation on 2,500 hectares of communally owned land given that the challenges are pretty much the same. The challenges for rural development arise from the fact that there was a deliberate plan to exclude these rural communities from being part of any economy. These rural areas were therefore never designed for any form of development. Rural development, and specifically agriculture, development quickly finds itself with a whole lot of challenges. One, the degraded soil and land conditions. Good potential land, but with degraded soils, over grazing trees and bushes, the cost of rehabilitation just becomes too much. The second challenge you face is the lack of documentation of farming or planting history and lack of research and development. Unlike the traditional maize belts, there is not a readily available history of even what inputs to use, what kind of seed cultivars you must use, fertilizers and chemical mixes best suited to farming in most of these rural areas. Third challenge is a lack of uh, farming infrastructure. There's very little farming infrastructure in place, making the setup or establishment costs very high. Establishment infrastructure would include farm buildings or operational base, fencing mainly, most of this land is not fenced, and good dams. The fourth area of challenge is the mechanization challenges. The absence of good quality mechanization contractors in the area means that any sizable commercial farming operation would need to own most of its own equipment. Contractors that are available are mostly not in the immediate areas, are not always reliable, and are very expensive. The fifth challenge is limited, degraded, or non-existent support infrastructure. That includes clean water, resources, degraded roads and bridges, and very little or no operational rail infrastructure. 
Then you have the next challenge, which is the lack of security of tenure for communal land. And therefore that is followed by the next challenge, which is lack of access to finance. So banks and other agri-finance institutions perceive high cost and risk in lending working capital and investment finance to farming operations in rural areas and on communal land in particular. The lack of tenure security is the reason cited most by the financing institutions for withholding funding support. By the way, that's exactly why we pulled this there. We are forcing the boundaries. We have to push the wall. It is not enough to say because people have no security of tenure and therefore you cannot fund them. But the biggest challenge again is the community development and the trust deficit. It is this challenge of community development that as we polled, we have found to be the most difficult to deal with. We took the bold step of partnering with 2,273 communal landowners from 34 villages in the Mguma and Mbasha districts in the Eastern Cape to create a commercial farming operation on 2,500 hectares of land. This area includes the poor rural towns of Pendane, Butterworth, Idujwa, Mamakwe, Willow Vale, and Eliodale. Those areas, Dr. Mzonyane, you've been there. Um, almost 40% of our time is spent on social mobilization and facilitation of these communities to create stability in the project. We also work closely with the chiefs and their traditional leaders and their involvement has been uh, critical. Seven years later, the project has produced over 37,000 tons of maize, over 100 million rands in crop revenue, with 45 million rands cash, and 16 million rands worth of maize distributed to these participating communal landowners. 1,500 permanent jobs and seasonal jobs have been created. We do have a youth development program and importantly, strangely enough, 60% of the participating landowners are women. <coughs> AFGRI is among the many critical partners we are working with and they have built a 15,000 ton grain storage bunker in Tendane. The first ever commercial storage facility in the Eastern Cape, all of it. This is a big game changer, not only for this community, but for the Eastern Cape as a province. As a child of uh, Dr. Mzonyane, Wipold is determined to make its Eastern Cape operation work. He has, after all, made us believe that we can do it. And all of us need to make agricultural development work all over rural South Africa. So what better gift could we give this icon? That is our Dr. Musuyana, while he is still with us, to see his vision on the rural development side actualized. Dr. Mutsuanyane Foundation Board of Trustees and Management and Team have the awesome, awesome experience and privilege and honor but a difficult task of navigating through this complex program of rural development 
with emphasis on agriculture, side by side with their patron, Dr. Mzonyana himself being present. They too are giving it their absolute best to make sure that this vision he has does actualize in his lifetime. From outside, we see it as a privileged position because himself being a living icon, he can still articulate and revise his vision. Because he's a living patron, he has handpicked you guys as his team. Paul Temba, he has handpicked you guys as his team. This team fits his dreams. And so the option to fail is not available for you. Rural development must and it should succeed because that is his marching orders. And so from Reverend Tio Soga all the way to Dr. Mitswanyane, we see the march of great and good men and women, the march of icons, people who give it their all to make things better for those around them and for our beloved South Africa. We owe you an enormous debt of gratitude, Dr. Mitswanyane. And we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for the privilege of being in your midst and witnessing the magnificent legacy that you have created. The example that continues to inspire so many of us. We thank you for your boldness. We thank you for your courage. We thank you for your intentionality and we thank you for your audacity. Thank you very much. Ms. Robert, thank you so, so much. Um, I think what we're going to do now is just allow some, some questions um, from, from the floor or online. Um, I'm not sure if there's anybody, if we could also limit it to very short questions and also the responses, if we might please keep them quite brief. We are pressed for, for time now. Um, so from the floor, I'm not sure if there's anybody that's, that's got a question. And if there's a mic, the mic is there. Any, any questions on the floor? Um, thank you. Sorry. Um, Mabat. Naki Willy Mudise. Ki Dirla Lenta Tomotsunyane Hari mobilize and mobilizing black people to to buy shares in the African bank. The greatest challenge he faced was that black people did not believe that other black people can take care of their money. So it was more of a gospel than anything else. And I believe the need thereof has not ended. In those days, we got support from the rustic rural people, rural people, not from people who could speak English. Now, I see there is a paper here at Nayare Pledge. Um, Rensabel. Nayare Pledge. This pledge presupposes, as I read it, for we must pledge money for the sustenance of the, of the foundation. Now, I would want to disrupt it a bit and say, let every one of us here fill in this form. If you do not have money that you want to pledge, pledge to open up a banking account with the African bank. 
because the African bank is taking care of uh, the foundation as well. You know, after we have filled in this form, at nine at her workplace there, in the workshop, she will then assign somebody to call us and remind us of the pledge that we shall have made today of opening up just a savings account with the African bank. So it's cash money or whatever pledge, and the one of opening up the African bank is in honor of Mutsunyane himself. Thank you. Thank you, Ramudis. I'm not sure if uh, you want to respond to that. I'll, alternatively, there was a section where Re uh, Mulamu was going to speak on fundraising. I, I think maybe let's pause that one until he, he deals with it. Okay. okay. Uh, is there any, in, there's another question? In, in the meantime, I'll, I'll, I'll go to the online questions. Um, so you'll be the last one if I take the question on the screen. Um, a question from Mr. Nsabele. The lecture is now in its fifth year. What is the significance of these lectures? And what has been done to ensure that the general public understands the role that this lecture plays or its intended intends to achieve? What has been the key performance indicators to show that the set targets are met? No, uh, thank you. Um, the lecture in its nature is not a review, but it's, it's a time that we, we, we take to celebrate the icon uh, that is our patron. So we, we, we host the lecture to, to reflect, um, to, to take stock. I was privileged to, to, to have the two giants having a, a, a discussion where we had Dr. Ro Koza and, and our patron uh, in Winterfeld, and Dr. Rel Koza reminded us that we are very fortunate to have the sage still living, where we can draw from the fountain and the knowledge of the wisdom that they can bestow on us as leaders in business and civil society and in, 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 in the political sphere, to, to look at ourselves on a day-to-day and, 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 and have these benchmarks that they've set so high that we've been shown the way, the, the path has been lit for us. We merely have to walk it. So we, we use the lecture as, as, a, as, a, as a time to, to, uh, to, to, to inspire uh, people out there that are watching this lecture to say, you know, uh, Dr. Sam walked eight kilometers to school when he was at Wilberforce. So for a kid that's having to cross rivers and walk to school, we're saying to you, you know, here's a man that did the same and grew up in the same conditions, that was able to start a bank, to that entrepreneur in Mabopani in Soweto that's dreaming of launching a company that can one day have an IPO at the London Stock Exchange. We're saying, here's a man that has done it. So we, we use these lectures to inspire people and, and to reflect and, and drive the, 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 the political and economic discourse to take stock of where we are as a people. Thank you, and to teach, right? Thank you. Uh, our last question. Um, Dumela Mbakaito, my name is Victoria Rasefola, and um, I'm very honored to be invited to this, and thank you very much for organizing this. And I think um, this question is to all of us, particularly from what um, Meg Gloria Sorabe was saying. She said, apartheid used the best equipment or tools to deprive us of um, financial and economic access. And I think the question to us, including Baholo Baron around the room, is have we used the best equipment for inclusion? And I work, I'm in a banking industry, so I understand how frustrating it is to see black people still not having access to economy or even finance or even credit. Um, so I think maybe the question to all of us, I'm asking myself the same question. How do we get our heads together to say, how do we use the best equipment? Because I don't think we did use, we use the best equipment. How do we, while Baholo Baliting, just advise each other to say, what is the best equipment? 
we've got an idea, but it would be great if we share it together. I guess that, that's the first thing. And the second thing, sorry, is to get more information on the asset-based development approach. Because I see the benefits of it, but I don't understand what that actually just mean in, in practice. Um, thank you. Any specific person you would like to respond to your question? Um, um, it was part of Ma Sorovis' uh, uh, speech, but I think maybe the foundation will be in a better position because they're the ones who uses it. So, so I'll speak maybe on, on what you're saying. Thank you so much. And, and I think that's why we, we, we gather leaders and, and have this lecture to, to ask ourselves very pertinent questions to say, uh, have we honestly done what is best for our people? using the leverage and the levers and, and the tools that we have. A few years ago, uh, our deputy chairman, Professor Lenyai, went to the land bank with the patron to seek funding. And this is a FDI that was created to, to fund black farmers uh, and absorb the, the risk element that the normal banks would not venture into. And it was very disappointing that uh, nothing came out of it. You know, and, and if you look at the history of the land bank, it was designed to, to take on those risky projects in agriculture. And, and it was the driving tool that, 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 that led to the development of what we see as mega and commercial farmers. A few weeks ago, we were in a meeting with, with the same, some of the DFIs, and we zoomed in into one of the, the books of one of these DFIs, where they have 30 billion rands on their books and less than 1% went to black farmers. So we, we have to ask ourselves a very serious questions. Uh, and, and I think uh, I wanted to just add to, to what you're saying that we, we, we have to, you know, when we leave here, uh, we've got the PIC. Uh, Ms. Robert spoke about the, the, the three, the finance, the pension, and the savings that we can use the capital to, to, to drive development. So we, we have to start engaging differently. Um, and I'll, I'll let my trustee, uh, Memo Tsunyani, to speak about uh, the model, because she's driving it, she's doing her PhD in it, and she's very much involved in day-to-day -day with it. And, 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 and that actually leads us to the next point, because she will be coming up. So what I'd suggest is that she comes up. That was the last question. Um, she is a professional and an expert in community development. So. Rakhadi, if you can come up, Otlabu Felili Zaka Kaliboko to usher in the remarks from Ndatemukul. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and just in response to the question on the asset-based community development, I think as Africans we 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 have from Nakuya Lowe we have lived and survived on using our own assets. Uh, Asset-based development is not a new thing. It's just that post-1994, I think we forgot who we are, and we relied so much on being given, on things being done for us. Uh, before, before 1994, we used to live on land. Uh, we used all our assets, including ourselves, seeing ourselves as assets, but we forgot about that. Uh, reliance on the state for everything and not taking responsibility. So the asset-based approach is actually reminding us that we do have assets around us, starting with ourselves. We have land. Uh, we, uh, the Monsonyane family from the 1800s started buying land and um, they lived on land and their wealth was created through land. Uh, we went to school on donkey cats, and today who we, here we are, because children of today, they can't even do anything without being carried from one point to the other. So the, the dependency level, it's very high. Uh, I'm one person who's not against social grants, but to the extent that social grants are not implemented in a transformative way, uh, it's actually killing the country. Not only social grants, but all the freebies that people are getting without being responsible. That is why you're finding people vandalizing even the projects that were meant for their own development. And uh, the, 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 the uh, Citrus Farm, the Citrus Project, which actually has been such a sore thing for, for Rangwane, it's because he put 
his effort, even his own funds, in the development of that project. But because uh, the, the, the tendency of dependency uh, re resulted in them not even appreciated, appreciating what was done for them. So uh, that is basically what the asset-based approach is. It's reminding us that we do have assets. The very social grants are an asset because it is the very social grants that people invest in stock files. And those stock files go to the banks, the banks that also see them as the unbankable. So it is, it is time that we should realize that we do have assets as black people and we can actually take responsibility and be able to develop our own wealth. So that is the approach that we are taking as the foundation to make sure that people begin to appreciate the assets they have and they begin to use them for their own social and economic change. Thank you. And, And on that note, ke bulele rangwane, mukheti mutsenyane, mukena wa khamudi musana nonyana, mutwa khalu kubu kubu lelu kumu lokwane, lenseng liru kubu kubu tapedi, tapedi amusi amutanga, hata zwanga di koro, lewa kumele lelu kumbona kaswane, zaka kaswane iti kudila. I think we deal about cocoa as a miholodi. I bet at your last pudu fudu kaman. Hatima hosi amangue a latula dilo. I tak and ya diata. I bet as him a badi badi. Hassani and a hala tulidilo. Mutraham dimusana no yan. Hassani had the fabulawa. Ya wake it to Bulawa noha. Me homali me fenyane ya di lepe ya ya masita. Tape di tape di amusi amotanga. Kemo tuaka mudi musana nonyana nonyana zang mashi libesi siko mo. Realeboka mesadi. Um, we are approaching towards the end of our, of our program, but we cannot do so without giving the patron an opportunity to give remarks. Like it's if Datamakolo will be giving his remarks or re re linyai. I, I, <clears throat> I'm not quite well, so I had uh, uh, asked somebody to say <clears throat> my little bit of, of, of whatever I, I would have said, but uh, I, I usually speak uh, long and I don't want to disappoint this crowd here <laughs> by speaking too long. I've asked Professor Linyai in five minutes to say what I would have wanted to say. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Remu Tuenyani. Um, it's not easy to speak on behalf of Dr. Mutsunyani when he is present. <laughs> so my license for saying things that I would have loved to say is very limited. Uh, for us in the foundation, the lecture the annual lecture is our highlight. And that is why Dr. Mutsunyani and his wife, Mae Jocelyn Mutsunyani, even though they are not feeling very well, have agreed to grace our occasion. And when Dr. Mutsunyani two days ago said, I should come and speak on his behalf, I said, 
what do you want me to say? And he gave me three things that I should say. And I'm going to stick to the script because nobody is going to get a report from nobody else because he is here. He said, I must indicate that it's the first time that we have a lady presenting the annual lecture, which a, a, a effect that has been said already. But not only did we get a lady to come and present the lecture, we have been able to get an excellent entrepreneur in Mrs. Sorobe. If you look at what we told Whip hold, sorry. Whip hold has done, I think in five, six years, it has managed to be on the JSE. Some, some, some companies take years before they get onto the. <laughs> but something that also excited Dr. Mutsuenyani was the fact that Whip hold the organization that is led by our guest lecturer has done wonderful work as you have heard her talk about what they've done in the Butterworth, Kentani area. It's, it's an area where uh, the Vice Chancellor, Mr. Sunil, uh, we met. Uh, only to come and meet again when we hear about what is happening in the Kentani, Kentani area. The development, as we heard from May Serobe, 60% by women. It says something about women. The other thing that Dr. Mutsuenyani asked me to say is that there has been a change in the name. We used to be called the Dr. Sam Mutsuenyani Rural <coughs> Development Foundation. Now, uh, I think some of the NAFCOC colleagues of Dr. Mutsuenyani, some of them are here, I've seen them. Uh, they felt that putting an emphasis on rural development seems to undermine the great legacy that he has left us in the business world. And therefore, we've changed the name to the Dr. Sam Mutsuenyani Foundation. But that name does not exclude rural development. Uh, I, I hope the NAFCOC contingent will be satisfied. The foundation has succeeded in supporting a few students financially, and this is due to thanks to the African Bank who have almost single-handedly funded our bursary. But I hope others will hear this and want also to add to the fund, our bursary fund. We also are in collaboration with the Tswane South Tivet College, busy with a project to resuscitate the Marapiani uh, Agricultural College. I mean, in a country like in South Africa with so much undeveloped land, we cannot afford to close an agricultural college. And we hope that with time, 
this will uh, come to fruition. And we're, th we're having plans that next year something significant should come out of this issue. And finally, uh, this is my two, two cents worth, which uh, Mesa Di Mutsonyani also touched on when, he talked, when she talked about asset-based development. In assisting our communities, and I hope the Bakhata uh, Kilewoni, in assisting our communities, we've got to win them, move them away from this dependency syndrome. And that is why we have come up with the issue of asset-based development. A lot of our projects, particularly in the past, failed because communities never saw themselves as owning the development. If something goes wrong, they will come to the foundation and say, A, B, C, D has broken down. And when you say, what have you done about it? Uh, frequently, nothing has been done about it. We want to get to a point where we, a community would say, A, B, C broke down. This is what we have done. Can you help us go over the, this hurdle? And if we can get our communities to get to that point, to say, this is, I mean, if your car breaks down, where do you go? You go to your bank account and you find out what you can do about it. You don't come and report it to the foundation. Five minutes over. Uh, <laughs> one second, Tato <laughs> I, I, I have got to, to, to throw this one in. It comes from one of our African forebears, President Julius Nyerere. He says, if real development is to take place, the people have to be involved. I hope Thank you. Um, we are going to really the end end now. The last last end. Uh, to just uh, do the, fund, the fundraising and then a vote of thanks followed by Re Ndala and then that will be the end of our program. Will end it up ka but Remola, I I think Nagoyarona says it has gone way past. So if we can try and compact while asking for support and money in two seconds. Oh, question. Okay, I'll do it. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for disrupting the program. My name is Solomon Azombi, Cameroon High Commissioner, and I want to speak under the control of our dean here, thanking the principal, the vice chancellor for the kind invite, in, invite here. I want to thank um, the Mrs. Serobe, the keynote speaker, for the thrust and treatment of a very interesting topic which I found very stimulating, inspiring and teaching indeed. And to you Paul, Chairman, when you started your speech you, you described the lushness of some land so good for agriculture. And um, 
I'm picking it from there and to say just a few words in guise of a tribute to uh, Dr. Sam Mutsue Hiane. To say that he spent a whole life promoting agriculture and the image of uh, water and greenery is very conducive. But there are moments which uh, drought, drought can be a friend to uh, agriculture. And I think uh, as the lectures move forward to the 6th, 10th, 20th, 50th, the sun will intensify on the pots of the ideas of Dr. Motsuayane, causing them to explode and disperse over the land. Uh, the fact that a good number of uh, my colleagues are here diplomatic, it means that we're moving away from here today with the ideas of Dr. Motsuayane, whom we are meeting for the first time. And so I think uh, you should, we are thankful to have the opportunity of meeting you and to listen to your ideas. South Africa must consider it, uh, itself very blessed to have you. And today, thanks to the invitation, we are able to participate in the blessing that you represent to this country and perhaps to our continent and the world. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. To Melang, uh, I've been given two seconds and it's gone. Uh, this is a very important s session that, uh, but what we'll do is uh, those that have completed the pledge card, there's a lady collecting at the back, but just can you just move them to one end so that she can do the collection? Um, what is important and what is key in all my talks or sessions, I always say this, education is an inoculation towards destruction. We need to educate ourselves. We need to be less dependent on other people. We need to make sure that we do this. Welcome everyone and thank you very much. I feel honored uh, to be part of this occasion and do also our patron today. Our patron today, Dr. Sam Zonyani, and all the speakers, all protocol observed. This is a very important occasion, but because of time, I'll be just speeding through. Now, what is key uh, on this is to see what the foundation, the current projects that are there. The important part is so much work has been put into these projects, but most of them, they have to be revived. They are not currently you know, in a suitable position to be really doing much. The appeal today is for the business people, the business economy to assist with all this. But there's so much work, Rensabel, there's so much work that needs to be done. I think we need to stop talking and start working. We need to show in the next lecture all the things that we, are, we have planned to do and we can show, you know, four. Now, I'll move to the next slides. Uh, you know, I've showed some of those, those uh, projects that are currently running. But what is key, it's the dream. Where do we wanna go? What do we want to do? What is the foundation there for? What it stands for? The entrepreneurial hub, I'll show you the picture later. 
agro-processing. I've been in Africa, I've been in Uganda, did the humanitarian aid in South Sudan. And you see how Africans have, they've got the product, but there's no product, there's no agro-processing, which is really sad. We need to do that in this country. And one of the key things, water desalination, it's something that we need to also dream about. Can you please show the entrepreneurial hub that is planned to be, we just have the sketch, we don't have all the other details, but we'll be showing, you know, the, there you can see what we plan, what the foundation plan to, to build. There will be training session, there will be offices so we really need, we really need your support to get this. I'm going to the next slide. Now, if you look at this, our patron, 2021, really funded, really funded the foundation. He pledged a million rent which was really making sure that the operations, and I think we need to do a standing in of evolution about that. <laughs> Thank you very much. And also with the assistance of African Bank, with the assistance of African Bank, they managed to place 250. They spoke about, uh, you know, bursaries and all that, assisting the students. But ladies and gentlemen, I think we need to make sure that we support the foundation and make sure that it's sustainable. Now, as we speak, can I ask that the pledges uh, be brought forward? And also, we are not going to read all of them. Uh, what we need is to know where we are today. My task was very simple. When you live here today, like uh, everybody's banking account must be zero. Methodist does that, kahona. you leave the church with no cent. So can I ask today that we get the, the pledges, but also what that the William Mudisa said. Those that could not, even those that could, can we also open up bank accounts with the African bank? And that information will be very, very important that we need to see from today going forward how the community is responding to this. So, the, uh, so I'm opening the floor for the fundraising, any donations that will be made to this. And I know with the pledges, it's nice to write, but also you need to write good amounts. But to follow up, you know, to get those into our bank accounts, we will do that diligently. We will even get to your house and, uh, you, know, you know, get the money. We really need the donations. With that, can I ask that somebody who's been tasked, uh, you know, to give us the information, we've asked them to, to do that. Those that want to, the mics can go around if you want to pledge or if you want to you, you want to donate to the foundation please raise your hand so that we can do this for a good cause that song that video i was here our patron is still here so before he leaves he must see all those things that we want to 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 build uh, you know, the state of the art uh, scholars or scholarships 
You know, there's a lady by Oziola in the U.S. She passed away. But her only dream, she actually invested after washing, you know, people's washing, going to houses and, and washing. Every cent that they gave her, diligently, every day, she was putting that into the bank account, into a bank account. And later, 30 years, she already had 500 US dollars in the bank account. And when they ask her, what is your dream with the money that is in the bank? She said, I would like to educate our children, whether it's a policeman, whether it's a, it's a judge or anybody, I would like to put this money into education. And when she was 95, her first student graduated from university. Now, this is an opportunity. Can I ask that we have pledges? Any donations? Where's the mic? Um, thank you. Um, it's Lucas. Uh, I would like to pledge, I think, over the next four quarters, uh, 5,000 per quarter, which will make 20,000 over the year. Anybody else? I see the patron has given us 250,000, but there's nobody really uh, advancing that. Is there anybody who has pledged that amount? Is there anybody who wants to, know, to donate? Please. That's a, a, a pledge for 10,000 rand from Mampari Investment Holdings. You know, my target today is 10 million rand. A company in this 10,000 rand, we will open savings accounts for ourselves and our employees with the African Bank. Timba, do we have a total? Oh, there's another. Oh, Mr. Dube, is it a million rent? <laughs> and those that want to do it in silent uh, can also approach uh, the foundation to do that. Timba, do you have a figure? It's around, it's 76,750. Can we make it 100,000? I'll throw the difference to get it to 100. To get it to 100. There's another hand. This, the, I think it's the last hand. Those that could not say it in front of everyone, you know, uh, giving us a million rent, uh, you can come and approach me. Okay. My name is Sandra Sefularo from Afro Medical City Holdings. I pledge 10,000 rent. Did all the trustees? Yes. Has pledged already 500,000 rands for this year on top of the 250,000 rands. Oh. Uh, is there any hint before I close? Ladies and gentlemen, is there another one? Yeah. 
Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. We are running out of time. I think uh, Mesorobe is supposed to be, uh, you know, boarding a flight. So with this, thank you very much. to African Bank. Oh, no, I could, there's somebody coming here to say it, yeah. And with that, I would like us to do the round of applause and uh, we move to the next subject. Dumelang Bakulu and our honorable guests. My name is Lucas Ndala. Um, Mine is just a simple job, um, is to pass our thanks and gratitude to all our guests uh, for today. Firstly, I would like to pass my thanks to our patron, uh, Dr. Sam Mutsunyani. Without you, I think we wouldn't be here. And thanks for coming up with this great um, idea of hosting an annual lecture. I think it's a great um, thing for us that you know, it's leaving quite a lot for us to reflect on. Secondly, um, to our um, guest speaker, Ms. Robe, which means uh, today you gave us a lot of knowledge. Um, those that don't understand Setswana, it means that um, uh, can you as a visitor visit so that we can, you know, have food, a feast. <laughs> so today we had a feast of um, knowledge, uh, ideas that, you know, have been imparted on us and the great work that you and we Paul are doing. Um, to African Bank, our partner, the University of Pretoria, thank you for being our partners. Uh, we really appreciate the partnership. Um, to all the honorable guests, uh, our diplomatic corps, um, you know, uh, Josi uh, Makapan, uh, all the uh, guests, we really appreciate your presence here. We are looking forward to seeing you again next year. Isn't that the Moholo always remind us that um, he is facing the sunset. We are still, you know, in the sunrise. So in Tatem Hall, we're hoping that next year you'll still be with us here, uh, you know, for another lecture. And, and I, all, I know that uh, at, the, at our last board meeting, you, you, you told us uh, that uh, you gave, you made us to commit to, to say that we'll make sure that we keep um, the, the foundation going. And Tatem Hall said that if we don't do that, <laughs> so uh, without wasting too much time, thank you and we really, really, really appreciate. We're looking forward to seeing you again next year. Please invite others next year. Let's make this um, a great lecture every year. Our communities out there are, needs to be uplifted. They are looking for all these ideas and also, you know, they are looking for someone to work with them, for someone who can hold their hand. And as you've heard that we've launched our ABCD model, which we believe that uh, you know, by holding hands together, we will all do great. Thank you, and we really appreciate Mem to over to you. Thank you, Rendala. Um, in the meantime, while Muruti Pungula comes forward to give us our closing prayer, uh, she can start walking forward. Um, I wanted to just reference Dr. Uh, Ruel Koza, he did a tribute for Ntate Mokolo's birthday. Okay. Um, and then what he said, one of the things that he pointed out was that there are three marks of a superior man. Uh, being vicious, he's free from anxiety. Being wise, he's free from per perplexity. And being brave, he is free from fear. So in closing, Rari, may we all become those leaders and may we all be the ones that raise the next generation of those types of leaders. Bakulu, thank you for your time today and being patient with me. Releboche, Bakupilor Keleboche Linisene as well for their support, for the donation. Awesome. For transport, Yanta Temohur. Bakulu, Releboche, Tat, thank you. May I ask that we all stand and receive grace. To God who has granted us with the wisdom to proceed with today's program successfully, we ask that you grant us again 
with your blessing as we leave this place. In the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen.